my bet, um, husband, Benny White. I'm Sue Sporty. <laughs> We've been married since 1992. Um, Benny was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, which is a euphemism for early stage dementia. That happened in 2008. So we've been on this journey together for a while. He can't speak of his life anymore, but I've lived with him for 26 years and have heard some of the stories. And in preparation for this talk, I also talked to some people who knew him when, before I did. So I'd like to say a few things about this lovely man. Or as the guy who hangs around the cookie table um, at, at um, Fellowship Hall. But Benny, is, he's much more than that. So I have been interested in the past weeks when we've been hearing about other African American members of the church. I've been interested in hearing about their early life. So I thought I would start there rather than some of the great things he did. Um, Benny was born in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1933. So if you're thinking about time, that's the Great Depression. His parents were originally from Texas, but they moved to Shreveport seeking work. And all three of, of Benny's the middle of three, they were all born in Shreveport, Louisiana. His folks moved back to Texas because jobs became more available there. Um, and they dropped Benny and his older sister off with his grandmother and kept the younger sister with them. Benny was about three at the time. Um, and all of the stories that he has talked about of his childhood are all of this grandmother. She owned a farm near Lodi, Texas, in the East Texas Piney Woods. She was a widow. She was somewhat older. She wore an apron all the time with a gun in it. <laughs> she would shoot snakes on the property. He remembers hearing a story actually about one time a guy came to try and offer to buy the farm and she shot at his feet until he left. Um, he talked about how she would kill chickens in the backyard either by whirling them around her head or by chopping them with an axe. But the stories that I know about Benny's youth are from that time, and I think he must have been like about three um, when, when he got left, and about six or seven when they all reunited near Dallas. Um, he went, he started school um, in this rural school um, district. He and his sister, um, and you can imagine, they're like six and four, walking down a little dirt country road to go to a little school. Um, in Dallas, and now this is like 1939, 1940, oh, we're well into separate but equal. So Benny went to a, a separate but equal school. He advanced quickly. He graduated when he was not quite 16. He went then to Texas College in Tyler, Texas, which is um, associated with the CME. During the time they lived in Dallas, his dad was a Baptist, his mom was CME, and the kids went to a totally different church. The way his sister described it to me, mom's church was high church, and we didn't like it. Um, so the kids went together to a church that was closer that they could walk to. Um, and she told me, and I hadn't heard this from him, um, that he would stand up on a box and read scripture or preach, you know, like when he was 10 or 11. But there are these three little kids without their parents, and they are just welcomed and loved by all of the people at that church. 
Um, after he graduated from Texas College, he was drafted into the Army. This is Korea, folks. I mean, you know, this is like 19, whatever, 52, along in there. So he was drafted into the Army um, and was sent to Anchorage, Alaska to watch the Russians watch us um, over the Bering Strait. He was in charge of artillery, of setting the, setting the range of, of all of the artillery because he was a math major in college and so he understood the mathematics necessary to do the fine tuning of the gauges. Um, he was a black man. <laughs> um, and, there were, <laughs> and there were a bunch of white guys, um, I, I, you know, think about 1952, and there were some fights and scuffles about how is it that he has power or more authority over us. But it was also in this time in the Army that Benny really discerned a call to ministry. He had thought he would teach math, but staying up all night um, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and watching the Russians um, and talking a lot with the chaplain and the other guys there, that's when he really felt a call to the ministry. So when the war ended and he went back home, he decided to go to seminary and he went to Howard. Um, yeah. He went to Howard School of Divinity. There was no money for him to do his parents. Any money that they had, they chose to give to the daughters because their belief was that a man could probably make it on his own, but the women would end up being housekeepers if they weren't fully supported. So any money there was in the family went to help pay the daughters college education. So Benny talked about how when he would get on the bus to go to school, members of the neighborhood would come by and put money in his pocket so that he could have money for food or to travel home. Um, this is, um, his first, after he left Howard, or leaving Howard, he stayed there an extra year. So he got his MDiv degree at Howard, but he stayed another year working at St. Elizabeth's where he was also received a residency in chaplaincy. And that was a decision that he needed to be making, was whether he wanted to be a chaplain or a, a, a parish minister. He ended up deciding on parish minister, and he went to Cincinnati, Ohio, to a German-speaking white congregation that lived, that was located in a changing neighborhood in Cincinnati, and they wanted somebody African-American to reach out to the neighborhood where the church was. So that's where he went. After he finished there, I don't know how long that was, four years, um, he moved to New York, lived on um, Long Island, and worked first for the New York Conference staff as an associate conference minister, and then for the New York City Mission Society. And one thing I will say about his time in West Hempstead, he ran for the school board, and um, the way he, he has scraggly beard. If you watch This Is Us, and you know Randall's dad, he has scraggly beard. That's what it looked like on the pictures. Um, but he ran for the school board. He got more votes than any African-American candidate had ever received, but lost by the largest margin that any African-American had ever lost by um, for the school district. Um, he moved to Chicago to become deputy director of the Community Renewal Society. Um, he lived here in Oak Park, folks, from like 1976 or so till 1991 and was active on the Fire and Police Commission, working to, to try and make sure that those services were racially diverse. Um, Benny was, has been active in the United Church of Christ larger settings. Um, I can speak from my own time, from 1992, when we got married. Um, when we would go to synod, oh, he was a rock star. If you think about a holy rock star, he would walk down the, you know, rock down the halls and just get mobbed with all kinds of people about all kinds of things. Some of them how are the kids, and some of them policy oriented. Um, so he was active both, I'm going to say, conventionally and perhaps 
unconventionally. He served on various boards, like he was the chair of the commission on, on or the chair of the Office of Church and Society Board. He served on the um, Executive Council, which um, uh, works with the officers of the church. But starting from early on, he also worked unconventionally. At, at an early synod, he was not a delegate, but a whole bunch of the African Americans got together and said, you can get voice without vote. And so every topic that comes up at synod, you switch it around and make it an issue of race. So he did. Anything that came up, it wouldn't matter how far-fetched, all of a sudden there was race inserted into it. It's like about 1963, 1965, in those early synods. Um, I, I, I talked to Davida Crabtree, who is more a colleague of mine, but was active in the church well before me. She says, I don't remember a synod where his wasn't an influential voice. She also said he served as the chair of the Office of Church and Society during some key times when other forces were out to reduce its impact. And Davida says, quote, with his administrative skill, eloquence, and political savvy, they didn't succeed. Um, he retired oh, after the, he was in the Massachusetts Conference. He was the conference minister in Massachusetts at the time we went there. He went there, and I married him a year later. Um, there were 438 congregational churches. It was the largest Protestant denomination in Massachusetts and one of the largest conferences in the United Church of Christ. Benny preached in a different church every week. We were all over the state for 10 years. One of the things he will be well remembered for, they had a gathering in the town of Worcester, Massachusetts, and all churches were invited. There were 11,000 people, 11,000 church people who came to a gathering in Worcester, Massachusetts. All the churches carried posters talking about what year they were founded. So like some of the ones from Plymouth um, had been there 375 years. It was really a quite, quite, a, quite an event. Um, he retired in 2000. And we stayed in Massachusetts for a couple of years while I finished my dissertation. And then we moved here. Um, we lived on the south side. Um, we joined Pilgrim in 2003. Um, and in theory, he was retired. In 2005, um, he was asked if he would become acting minister and acting executive minister of the um, wider church ministries of the United Church of Christ. So he went and lived in Cleveland while I stayed here. Um, and he lived there for seven months um, and helped bring some administrative stability to that organization. So he was home then for a couple of months and then he was asked to step in on an interim basis um, for the insurance board. Um, the exec had been fired and they needed to, someone to step in. So he stepped in and went and lived in Maryland for five or six months. Um, and now he really is retired. And, and we are happy to be here. Thank you.